Straight Talk Africa, a conversation with Dr. Hage Gaingob, the President of the Republic of Namibia. We'll talk about his vision for the people of Namibia, the region, and the African continent. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, September 14th. I am Shaka Sali. Well, hello to you, Shaka, and hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Mariama Diallo, your social media reporter. Today, it's a conversation on a range of issues with the Namibian head of state. And we are looking forward to an exciting hour and hoping that everyone in Namibia and elsewhere will join this conversation. Coming up later in our STA inbox, we'll share your thoughts through your emails, tweets, and Facebook comments. That's ahead on Straight Talk Africa. Hope you'll stay with us. Hage Gaingob is Namibia's third president. He has a mandate to consolidate recent democratic gains and good governance in Namibia, the region, my colleague, Paul Sisko, has more on this story. Namibia, in southern Africa, is bordered on the west by the Atlantic Ocean. It shares land borders with Angola, Botswana, and South Africa. The nation has about 2.2 million people, and it is one of the few African nations with a stable, multi-party parliamentary democracy. Haga Gengab is the country's third president. In office since March 31, 2015, he succeeded President Hifi Kipunya Pohamba, who stepped down at the end of his constitutionally mandated second term. Then Prime Minister Gangob, who was also vice president of the ruling Southwest Africa People's Organization, took his place as the party's presidential candidate. President Gangob was elected by an overwhelming majority in November 2014. He did his undergraduate and graduate studies in the United States before serving Namibia in the United Nations from 1972 to 1975. He was then appointed director of the United Nations Institute for Namibia, and he's also played an important role in crafting the country's constitution. After decades of violent struggles and colonial rule by Germany and South Africa, South Africa's apartheid flag was lowered at Namibia's independence celebrations on March 21, 1990. Sam Nyoma, the nation's liberation hero, became Namibia's first president. He served three terms, then passed the ruling Southwest Africa People's Party leadership to Pahamba, who won the 2004 presidential election in a landslide and served two terms. Pohamba is one of four recipients of the $5 million Mo Ibrahim Prize for Good Governance. Launched in 2006, the annual prize goes to a democratically elected leader that serves only his or her constitutionally mandated limit while displaying exceptional leadership. Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu were awarded special honorary awards. The first winner in 2007 was Joaquin Shishanu from Mozambique. In 2008, Botswana's former president, Festus Moai, was also honored. Three years later, in 2011, it was Pedro Pires of Cape Verde that was recognized. And lastly... The prize committee has decided to award the 2014 Ibrahim Prize of, for Achievement in African Leadership to President Pahampa of Namibia. The African Union now wants Namibia's President Gengab to help with mediating the ongoing political crisis in Gabon. Jinping, Gabon's opposition leader, has petitioned the nation's constitutional court to recount last month's presidential election results, which officially declared President Ali Bongo the winner, touching off sporadic violence in the streets. President Hage Gengab is set to address the 71st session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York. Paul Sisko, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Paul, for that interesting report. Uh, joining us here in our Washington studios is a distinguished guest, the one and only Dr. Hage Gainigob, the president of the Republic of Namibia. I have to say, my friend, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you one more time on Straight Talk Africa. I'm greatly honored. To see you again. It's uh, a pleasure. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, 
a chance to call and talk with our guest. The number to call is 202-619-3111, and the U.S. country code is 1. Let me begin uh, very simply, frankly, by asking you, how would you like to be addressed? Your Excellency, Dr. Hage Gainagob, Mr. President, or Comrade Hage? Well, uh, I'm Hage. <laughs> you can call me Comrade Hage. Officially, I'm Comrade Hage Gainagob. But I'm Hage, You're Hage. friends like you. You know, there was a time, of course, uh, when I had the opportunity to interview Tanzanian President Benjamin Mukapa and asked him the same question. And he told me, you know, Shaka, if you called me Ndugu Raish, that will be fine. Meaning, of course, Ndugu President. Well, it's a pleasure to see you, of course, uh, in Washington. Let me ask you a question. You've been uh, President for one and a half years, correct? Yes, yes, yes. How does it feel look like? I mean, how does it uh, really feel like to be a president of a country? Can you walk us through a day in the life of President Hage Gainagob of Namibia? Like what time, for example, do you wake up? Well, I wake up very early, but I don't leave the bed. I start to read my papers, listen to the world news to know what is happening, and then I'll go to work. If I stayed at the state house, it's not far, so I just walk over. But if I stay in my, which I do, in my own place, then I drive with two cars only, no escorts, no street, stopping on the streets. But the life of a president, I don't feel it yet. You I'm, don't. I'm still new. <laughs> you know, you probably wouldn't anyway, because frankly, I have had the opportunity to interview very many presidents. And I have to tell you, when I looked at your CV, and of course knowing what I know about you, you are a very uniquely qualified head of state. Mm. You spent, for example, 14 years as a senior UN executive, which obviously gave you an opportunity to interact globally. You spent another 14 years, actually, as the Prime Minister of Independent Namibia. You were the Executive Secretary of the Global Coalition for Africa at the World Bank for a couple of years. You've been Minister of Trade, you've been this. How does that feel like? Well, it makes me feel old now. Really? The way you are now describing me. But you look very young. But uh, I must say it's a challenge. Uh, uh, Shaka, people put me there with massive majority. And I said, it is not a popularity here. It's a high expectation and greatest responsibility rests on my shoulders. But one person cannot do it. I said, I have to set up a team. It must be a teamwork. And I do really believe, instead of personality, we have to start to think of the processes, the systems and institutions, not individuals. But you seem to have known long time ago, frankly, what you wanted in life. Did you get the opportunity to prepare yourself like the Madiba himself, in fact, once said that those 27 and a half years that he spent in apartheid South African prisons gave him an opportunity to read many, many books through which he was able to prepare himself for the role that he had to play later as president. Well, I was in the struggle, uh, as you said. Uh, all the assignments I got were through swap of party. I didn't apply for any of those jobs. But they exposed me to the life, to education also, lucky enough, and met Africans. I was mentored by very good African leaders like Professor Adebayo Adajeji, my friend, Salim, Ahmed Salim, many of them that I met here at the UN as an ordinary petitioner. So I've seen Africa, I lived in DRC those days, tough times, but Africans are Africans. We couldn't communicate, but they were saying, Congo, Southwest Africa, ah, that was the only communication. So therefore to me, I can live anywhere in Africa, I'll feel at home. And therefore, 
the job I have now is the assignment by Namibian people for a time period that starts with five years. If I'm in good shape and they want me, maybe the last them would be second. But that is not yet on the cards. I am dealing with four years that is remaining now. Do you have any heroes in your life? Who is your hero or is there any particular individual that inspired you to become the best that uh, you could become? I ask you this question especially because I put that same question to an East African president many, many years ago. And he said, you know, Shaka, uh, you know, knowledge is objective. All you do is go out and see things and look for solutions. If I had uh, so many types of heroes, I had so many types of people who inspired me, then I would probably end up as a, co a composite of contradictions. <laughs> I don't want to be that then. But there were, there were people who played an uh, important kind of role in one's life. Starting also with Semi Oma, my mm -hmm. president, we grew up together actually, literally, mm -hmm. and started to set up the party, we worked together, but then as we were moving on with the revolutionary struggle, I must say the man who made impact on me is Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro? Oh, oh yes, that's my... In what you know. way? Well, firstly, we went to Cuba in 1977 with President Yoma. And Castro met us. And that's the time we are now going from fighting to Resolution 435. And President Obama was going to explain to him, to the revolutionary Cuban president, that he is not going to fight, we are going to vote. And President Obama took a long time. It was not easy to say we are not anymore going to fight and so on. Over one hour. Castro just said and listened. Now, I was here at the UN. I'm telling you, our African brothers, younger than Sam Yoma, once we met, he's talking for five minutes, Sam, listen here. He'll be interrupted and be lectured. Interesting. Here was President uh, Castro sitting for one hour just listening. When Comrade Nyoma finished, he said, uh, look, this is your country. You came to ask for weapons, we'll give you that. Now you want to get a ballot paper. You get that too. It's your country. Mm -hmm. But can I just ask one question? Are you going to win the elections? He paused a little bit and said, yes, with hard work. Because SWAPO was formed inside the country. We didn't form it outside the country. So we have to support there. So with hard work, we'll win. And we did that. We, had, we worked very hard. And that's a man, to sit and listen that way. And Cubans died, the interest for Namibia and Africa. Right. And they will tell you they didn't collect gold or so on, but only dead bodies of their people to take back, touching. Let's talk about uh, the vision thing. What is your vision for the people of Namibia, the region, and indeed the African continent? You see, my vision for Namibia is encapsulated here. We have a little bit of a house. I'm saying nation building is just like building a house. When you build a house, you first clear the area and then you dig the foundation. Strong foundation, then you, build the, you use the bricks and then you build your house. With Namibia, we cleared the field with UN supervised elections. Then we set down to draft the constitution at the foundation. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling Namibians, because we come from different ethnic groups, that we are now the BRICS, the Damaras, the Hereros, the Ovambos, all of us, white, Germans, we are now the BRICS. The motor that keeps the BRICS together is our laws we pass in the parliament. But the lesson is, once you have built up the wall, you let it firm up, you plaster it, very important. Once you have done that and paint it, you no longer see individual bricks. You no longer will see individual tribes. So therefore, in this Namibian house, let's live there as one Namibia, one nation. 
let's hold hands and move in harambe spirit in the same direction same for africa i believe in african house where all africans from different regions will one day in this harambe spirit pull in the same direction so also of the whole world very interesting uh, that is perhaps like the moral equivalent of uh, the rainbow coalition now we'll pause for a short break and we would like to remind you that straight talk africa is now on the social networking website twitter and we are tweeting live followers at voa shaka that's voa shaka we join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments don't forget to use the hashtag voa namibia and we are still on facebook just enter the keyword straight talk africa become a fan and connect with other friends of the voice of america we'll be right back with you so please don't go away like voice of america on facebook follow voa on twitter join voa on our youtube channel like follow join voa this is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question. Keep your comment brief and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back. Of course, this is Straight Talk Africa coming to you live from Washington. Walk us back uh, to 1989 when you were the chairman of the Constitution of the, of the Constituent Assembly. You are trying to put together a constitution that will usher in uh, independence for the new nation of Namibia. The constitution took you three months. Suppose, in fact, have taken you two years. Yes. How? What kind of magic did you use? No magic, it's just to consult people. I went to all the leaders, opposition leaders. I said, I would like to see you at your house. And some of them were my former enemies. So I went to one of them, that's the make one case, one of them, David. And when I came there, they said, we hate Africaners, we don't speak Africans, and so on. So when I came there, he was talking to his wife in Africans. So I just went in Africans and say, I also want to have rebels tea. Then that broke the ice. We went inside the house, already relaxed. Then I said, Mr. David, I'm here. As you know, I'm through and through Swapo. But you have elected me, meaning the assembly. And therefore, I will be your chairman. So I'd like to know what your fears are about having a black government. You know, in our case, we just want to have three meals a day for our children. We want them to go to school unmolested, have lights to study. That's the same for us. I see you see, Mr. David, the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. Very interesting. So what about uh, when you went to report or to brief the chairman of Sopo himself, Sam Nyoma? Yes, well, I had to always, in between, go. I have to keep them abreast, of course. So when there are difficult issues, we'll adjourn, then other for consultations, or to go and uh, brief the chairman and rest of the comrades. Now, how we move so fast is that I look at the different drafts, and I look at communalities. So I say, why should you waste time on things you agree on? So we got rid of them, mm -hmm. and only talk about material differences. Within that, you had about the type of the parliament, the presidency, or prime minister. It was a key, because the others were saying presidents in Africa are dictators because right. they have too much power, mm -hmm. with the prime minister. And so they came with term limits. If you are going to insist on your executive presidency, mm -hmm. then there must be a term limit. And term limit of what, two, five years, or ten years. And I kind of agreed, so I, 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 I said a break. 
Then I went to leave my boss. I was doing just like he was doing with Castro. Mm -hmm. I was beating around the bush a little bit. And I said, hey, these people, these puppets, they want to block us from having the executive president, but we'll get them. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to just have uh, 10 years and so on. No, it's okay. I'm already old enough. I nearly collapsed. Really? I was so shocked. Why? Why, why did you nearly collapse? I didn't because expect he would accept it. You thought like he would that. just be like uh, the vast majority of the African <laughs> leaders? No, I don't know. For decades? I, uh, definitely, he said that, and I said, oh, thanks God. I ran back. So having said that, uh, what happens now back in uh, 2000 when uh, the gentleman uh, tries to shift the political constitutional goalposts and in fact wants another term? A third well, term, some call it third term. Yes, I call it third term. You see, sometimes we have to look at the paper, the constitution, the conditions in the country, and then deal with realities on the ground. I... He came to talk to me, again to me, and said, time has run so quickly, and I could agree with that too. And the rest of them are confidential things we discussed. Mm -hmm. And then we came to the conclusion, I said, now you have been all your time in the, time in the bush. Some of your colleagues have been there 20 years and later on became them limited uh, presidents. To give you extra five years to sort things out as you are saying, I'm, I'm going to pull it. And I, we didn't change the term limit clauses. The constitution, the transitional clause, which says the first president shall be elected by constituent assembly mm -hmm. and shall serve for two five-year terms. We only put three five-year terms. So are you suggesting, in fact, that uh, Pierre Nkurunziza, president of Burundi, probably, might in fact have borrowed a leaf from Namibia. Well, why not? If he, because it is done for a good cause. Today, I'm the third president. Supposing we made a mistake there. Constitution that we were going to count on was in English, not even internalized by the masses. That's how sometimes we impose things, and when things go wrong in Africa, we say, look at Africans. I averted that. Today, we have a thriving democracy. Let's talk about uh, the issue of poverty. Uh, the first lady, Monica, uh, says that uh, you are very, very sincere, really, uh, that uh, it is from your heart that you would like to see, co you know, uh, poverty not, uh, no, not alleviated, not curbed, but eradicated. Tell us about that. Well, firstly, Namibia is a rich country. Everybody says that. But inequality in Namibia is about the worst in the world. Now, when in a small population, so when I'm thinking of this vast country, it's true, it's dry country, but a small population like this, we shouldn't sit do halfway things. Why should I say half a poverty is good, then no poverty? Say eradication. Of course, we will go step by step. Eradication. And as condemned by my colleagues, mm -hmm. where have you ever eradicated poverty? And after that, we came here, and you and adopted to eradicate poverty 2030. Mm -hmm. I went back and said, you'll see. And I'm saying ours must be eradicated in 20, 20, 2025. 2025. What specific steps have you taken uh, so that people, in fact, uh, might not end up saying, hey, President you know, Hage is simply talking the talk. But yes. can he really walk that talk so that Namibians can walk the walk? That's a problem. We discuss it sometimes. We Africans have good, glossy papers. We talk. But the implementation is a problem. And I set up this uh, four-year plan, Harambe Prosperity Plan. And first thing is, governance architecture. Mm -hmm. We in Africa problem of accountability and transparency. So I have a formula, mathematical formula. A plus uh, accountability, responsibility, accountability equals trust. Mm -hmm. So I say if we are accountable, we are transparent, 
A plus T equals TR. Accountability plus uh, accountability and uh, uh, transparency. Transparent. Accountability, transparency equals trust. Africans have lost trust in many of us as leaders. We are not accountable, we are not transparent. So first thing I did is to declare. You need to deliver. In fact, you declare that your assets and wealth. Yes. Why did you do that? In fact, it's not a requirement. It's, it's not, not a legal requirement. It's not required. By Namibia. Some people see me in these suits, which I like to wear, and they think maybe I have a lot of money. Or and you have incredible illegal, <laughs> Thank you. The illegal money. So I said best is to start on the top. I'm talking about accountability, transparency. Let me be transparent. And I did that with Trans Pricewaterhouse, Coopers. One guy came from America who was part of the reviewing. I opened up. Even they were saying I have foreign accounts. I was a UN secretary at staff member. I have my credit union account, which I'm not going to close. Mm. All of them banks were there, whatever remains there. And they did their own checkup, and that's what I did. My wife joined me too because it was good for her to do that. But it was not trying to be a holier than thou. It's just to start with what I'm talking about, trying to walk the talk by saying I'm going to trans be transparent so that I can hold the others also accountable and be transparent. How do I tell the ministers to do this and this if I don't, they don't know what I have? have they, how have they reacted? Excellent. Terrific. Excellent. You know, I was doing my homework and uh, I discovered that uh, you have done reasonably well in terms of, in fact, alleviating poverty because uh, you have, in fact, lifted anywhere between 400,000 to 500 people from poverty. Uh, do you think uh, that is enough for the last 25 years that you have been politically independent? Look at Brazil, for example, Lula da Silva, a man who tried the presidency three times and got it on the fourth time and event eventually, in fact, ended up being perhaps the best president that Brazil has ever had. And this is a man who actually never went through formal education. Mm. He lifted more than 20 million people from poverty in eight years. Well, I don't know about that. Firstly, is it better to have 500,000 than zero? We have done that. It was a beginning, we are doing it, but I don't think that having zero lifting is better than 500,000, so I'm happy with that. Besides that, it's an ongoing struggle. The Brazilian situation, how old are they? How many years? We are only, that time, about 25. Yeah. 25. Yeah. And we come from a different background of racial discrimination, apartheid, and we have to first maintain peace, too. Also, Brazil has a bit of that, too. Yes, but uh, the way they, where they, where they oppress that way, oh, where, yeah. they, where they oppress, where the blacks, they oppressed by foreigners from outside. Namibia, we have whites who came who suppressed the blacks. They have the same situation because, uh, in fact, the vast majority of the political elite in Brazil over the years are descendants of Portugal. And uh, most of the poor people, in fact, are descendants of Africa, who had actually Brazil found their the, way there through Namibia, slavery. We are working well, think, on this. I think yeah. you're fine. Well, you are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment. But first, here is Maria Majero. Take it away, Maria. Thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the outstanding feedback we've received from our audience through social media. Do stay with us, please. Don't go away. Today's youth are not just the next generation of African leaders, they are today's leaders. And this is the time to invest in them, today, not tomorrow. So let's connect, let's engage with each other on issues that will transform our societies. Innovation, leadership, entrepreneurship, things that you're doing to move the continent forward, to make you the greatest generation that Africa has known. It's up front every Wednesday, 17.30 UTC, right here on The Voice of America. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. 
The number is 202-619-3111. And the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much. It's to give you your word and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Mariama. Take it away again, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. Some analysts say that Namibia has a large deficit that the government may have difficulty containing. In addition, Namibia's 2.2 million citizens face an unemployment rate of about 28%. Its rural, cashless subsistence economy is in dire need of reform. The beautiful uh, country that shares borders with uh, Angola, Zambia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and South Africa has tremendous natural resources, including diamond, copper, gold, silver, and tin, uh, just to name a few. It's also the world's fifth largest producer of uranium. Well, this will lead us to our question of the week, which asks, what can be done to ensure that Namibia is on a path to a prosperous, prosperous future, rather? But well, starting off uh, the conversation is a viewer from Nigeria with our letter of the week. Omunua Okugbo Igodalo from Nigeria writes, Namibia is an important part of Africa. It needs a leadership with a very strong sense of mission and citizenry that is patriotic. Emphasis must be placed on students obtaining a high-quality education with a high level of scientific and technological development. Namibians must believe in their ability to transform themselves as individuals and their country as a whole. Well, that was Omunua Okugbo Igodalo from the West African country of Nigeria. Before we move on to more comments, uh, first, thanks uh, everyone for using all our social media platform to communicate with us. And another reminder that we are tweeting live today. Just use the hashtag VOA Namibia. And if you haven't yet, uh, do follow us at VOA Shaka. Speaking of it, let's go to a tweet uh, from Sebastian Mahamba, a student at the University of Tanzania, who tweets that Namibians should have their clear common national vision that would unite them for brighter perseverance. We have another tweet while we add it, this time from Ortega, who says that Namibians should assure that rules of law and regulations of better government and better management. And he continues and says that mismanagement is dangerous. Well, now to a comment from a Facebook follower. Uh, it's Tate uh, Pedro in South Africa who writes, that the Namibian government must allocate each and every citizen a free plot of land. Most regular Namibians do not have land. Both public and private sectors should offer jobs to every Namibian. Commodities and income tax, which are both currently sky high, must come down. Well, Mr. President, if you are able to allocate a piece of land uh, to every Namibian, I think, uh, please let me know, because I might ask for uh, Namibian citizenship at this point. Uh, anyway, a range of questions here. Your thoughts? I think uh, your sending it is citizenship is good enough, uh, plus the fact that you may in fact have an American, and who knows, Paris. Adding to it, you know, I'll go to, I'll take Namibia anytime. I think Mr. citizenship... Mr. President, uh, your reaction? <laughs> well, I, I thank them. They are making very good comments. I agree with them completely. Uh, except maybe the last one, because it's difficult. Uh, land is a very emotive issue in Namibia, and we are trying to tackle it with great care. It is true that land was stolen by white people, let's say, 100 years ago. And say, Shaga, a child was born on a stolen land who happens to be white, on Namibian soil and Namibian blood. That child is as equally citizen as I am. So I cannot just therefore grab the land because the land was stolen by the father. When that father died long time ago, and that child is now maybe 50 years old, mm. on that land. Mm. So that is the difficulty we are dealing with. Constitution is talking about justice. 
rulers must administer in a just manner. When you take the oath, you have to protect that constitution. So we are doing what we can. It is true. Namibia is a land of quiet, you know, big disparities, haves and have nots. And sometimes that is growing up. That's why we are saying we declared war against poverty. And land is very important. Land is being bought. We are buying the land to settle those who are landless. It's a slow process. What people are saying is that process is not working. Willing buyer, willing seller. We must now maybe nationalize and so on. These have all their drawbacks. We are looking at it, but you see, peace is very important. Peace and democracy. When you have peace and democracy, you can decide and you have peace. Children are not going to run around like in Syria and so on. People should look at what is happening in some countries where there's violence. I keep on telling them it's easier to destroy, very difficult to build. You know, you talk about the issue of justice, and of course, uh, you happen to have arguably one of the best uh, constitutions, frankly, on this planet Earth. How do you respond to some who will say, wait a minute, Mr. President, justice, de justice delayed is justice denied? Yes. I, I, I agree with that, but we are not delaying it. It's not in the court. We are implementing. We are implementing the land policy. We are buying the land, and many of the Nova Rich are buying there. We all bought our own land, that we are also recovering our land. So we are doing something about it. I see. We are, we are settling our people, but we're not going to grab land, force from those who own it. What the Constitution says. Once you own something legally, it is yours. Like one of your neighbors. Yes. I hear you. <laughs> well, Mariama, do you have more reaction from social media? Yes. Please? Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's go to a Facebook post from Vincent Atuma uh, from Uganda who writes that when a country has a right leadership, uh, someone who is a visionary with a dynamic personality, every other thing concerning that nation's future will fall into place. Well, one more comment while we're at it, uh, this time uh, from Martin uh, Nyalusi from Tanzania, who writes that Namibia is on a path to a bright future if it can have good governance, stop corruption, and make sure that all of its citizens are benefiting from its natural resources. Shaka again, and Mr. President, uh, your thoughts. Mr. President, your reaction again. Once again, I thank them for those comments, Africans, I agree, I declared war against poverty and war against corruption. The fact that I declared my assets openly indicates that. And my ministers also had declared their assets. We also have lifestyle audits. And, and this is going to be done. You have to say, if you have certain things, if your salary is this, mm -hmm. how do you live this kind of a style? Where do you get the money from? So really the government, not me, government is doing a great deal to see that Namibia will at its curb, if not eliminate corruption. We are very serious about it. Well, Mariema, thank you very, very much uh, for bringing us uh, this week's audience reaction. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Shaka, and thank you, Mr. President. That will do it uh, for today's social media segment. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please keep them coming. If you are a new fan, just drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com or... Post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com or you can join our YouTube channel. Sign up to VOA TV to Africa and don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Another reminder that the show is streaming live every Wednesday. Just go to the VOA Straight Talk Africa TV program page on our website or simply watch us live on your mobile device. Just download the VOA mobile app. Now, let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, 
The 71st United Nations General Assembly is underway in New York, including a first-of-its-kind summit of heads of state and government to address large movements of refugees and migrants with the aim of bringing countries together behind a more humane and coordinated approach. We'll discuss that and other issues next week right here on Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back to our conversation on a range of issues with the Namibian president, Dr. Hage Gainagob. Well, again, I have to say that it's always a pleasure, of course, uh, having the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much. Talk to me about uh, some important decision that uh, you have made so far. What would you say, if you could put your fingers on it, that uh, it is the single most important decision that you have made during your presidency. And on the flip side of it, uh, what about the single most regrettable decision during that same period? Well, uh, there are several ones. I just need one. one. <laughs> no catalog, please. One is I to handle the corruption and so on, wanted to take steps. And there was a tender mm -hmm. for airport, mm -hmm. the cost of about seven billion. And I thought there were unethical ways of having uh, awarded that tender. And I stopped it through the ministries. And to my shock, as I was traveling here, the court apparently said it was wrong. So I think we may appeal that. You may. That was one big, big thing. I thought I was starting with a bang. Uh -huh. People are always saying there are no consequences in government. Yes. You can do things. Like, but then the court is saying I was wrong. And not me, but the government was wrong in stopping. And the point is the tender, tender rules are very clear. This is money that's going to come from treasury. Then you must follow the tender rule. It was not followed. But the court to say, so courts are independent in Namibia. I accept the court's decision. I will appeal. So is that something you regret then? I, because I, I regret because I want everybody to join to fight against corruption. But at the same time, you consider it to be uh, a very significant effort. It was a very, very significant effort. Very interesting. That could have set the stage for me. You see, during our conversation over the years, you have talked about your love for buying and reading books. What does education mean to you? Could you, in fact, have been in this studio today if it wasn't for education? Yes and no. Uh, I have seen many people who didn't go to school but who are very clever. But education is the great, greatest equalizer, I would say. Education opens all the doors. And in Namibia, starting with our founding president, we value education. When we started our struggle, young ones were sent to schools, and elderly ones were recruited for our struggle. So we always valued education. Uh, yes, if you are denied something, you, you thirst for it. But that's why we, I had to walk. I was not walking to go and fight. I was going to get a scholarship. That's why I walked to Botswana. You go and stay there for one year, four months to suffer, that almost, just in search of knowledge. That almost reminded me a bit of my history as if it was a great trek of sorts. It was a great trek and many people followed and all for education. And they, today, <laughs> education rewarded me richly, but not only that. Education now, PhD, is not what runs the country. We are now trying to emphasize vocational training. Because if you're going to build a country like mm -hmm. Germany was built by artisans, not by PhDs. So we are now emphasizing in this land uh, vocational training. After all, you did have a very strong relationship with Germany, and Germany is probably uh, a world champion in that business. What about uh, the strike in Namibia? Teachers' the strike, strike. Yes, the teachers are voting. You see, we have a law that uh, if you, are not, every year there is uh, discussions to increase the conditions of service. So teachers this time 
don't want to accept the 5% that the government is offering, even 8%. So you have mediation and so on. If everything fails, then the commissioner declares dispute. And that way, they have to go back now to their people to ask mandate to withhold their labor. And government equally can withhold paying them. You know, now we have no pay. Looking back, of course, at one time, not only were you uh, in a teacher training college, but in fact, you were a teacher, even though it was a very, very short time. Does that help you to sympathize and empathize with them? Oh, obviously we do. But I have also a problem, as I declared war. There are those who are unemployed, who don't get even a cent to add it on, 5%. So I'm saying let's hold hands. While we agree with them, we sympathize with them, and we are saying, however, there are also others who don't even have a cent. And therefore, we are trying to address through this pro program the plight of those who are unemployed. Unemployment is about 28% in Namibia. That's high. So we have to address that too. All of us are holding hands. And they are talking about politicians are getting more money and so on. Politicians were denied increment. All the years I've been there, we didn't increase, so they lagged back. And it was the committee that is doing, not us. Okay. Let's go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. Good evening, Patrick from Nigeria. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Good evening, Mr. Shaka. I am Good hugely evening, terrific. Excellency. Good evening. Good evening, Excellency. Good evening. Uh, Your Excellency, I thank you the way you tap the natural resources of Namibia and utilize them in areas of education, entrepreneurship, and food security. Your Excellency, sir, I want to find out this issue of corruption, as you know, it has ravaged Africa as a country. How do you tackle huge restiveness and this issue of our African leaders recycling personnel? in their government because of party affiliation. I'm very happy, Mr. Saka, for bringing your excellency to this program and giving us the opportunity to ask questions. Thank you very much. Thank Come. you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Let's go to Namibia. Good evening, Dylan from Namibia. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Dylan, Hello? can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Could you please ask your question? Um, I would just like to, uh, first, first greetings to our president. Um, I would just like to ask our president how come we don't incorporate um, lifelong learning and adult education in developmental programs such as the Harambe Prosperity Plan. Because clearly the economic approach has not worked. And perhaps the lifelong learning and adult education, because it is seen as a reintegrating model of bringing all institutions to tackle direct problems such as poverty or education. So how come government does not recognize and reintegrate lifelong learning and adult education in their developmental programs? Thank you very much. All the way, of course, from Namibia. Good evening, uh, Samuel from Uganda. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Uh, good evening, Lugushaka. How are you? I'm hugely terrific. How are you today? Uh, very terrific. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk to Mr. President uh, from Namibia. Mr. President, sir. How can Namibia assist Zimbabwe to become a fully fledged SADC member to reconcile it with Europe, especially Britain? How can you alleviate poverty so that Namibia becomes a middle class economic country? Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Shaka. What is your take, Ndugu President? Thank you very much. It's all yours, Mr. President. <laughs> well, firstly, I hope we didn't confuse Zimbabwe and Namibia. Well, Namibia is already classified as higher middle income country. And that's what I'm disputing. Because they just take the uh, gross domestic product, they divide a small population and get a high uh, per capita income. So Namibia is rich, you see. 
Yeah, we don't get the soft loans, grants, and so on, which is good. It made us to be self-reliant. But Namibia is already classified that way, which is if you go by mathematical mm. class, classification. But Namibia is poor because the majority of people are poor. Do you qualify for the MCA? Yeah, they, they, they made an exception, and I'm telling you, that's one of the most effective plans I've seen. We thank Americans for that. I see. President Bush. I see. I'm telling you, they build libraries, they improve on tourism, they build schools. It's beautiful. The Millennium Challenge Corporation, of it course, was, yes. It was implemented in Namibia 96%, and one of the ladies who was there, I took to monitor now our own programs. Interesting, interesting. Uh, yeah, what about uh, the gentleman from uh, Namibia? He had this yes, issue about uh, education. Thank you very much to call from home. I'm glad you are also following this program. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you, but uh, when you look at Harambe Prosperity Plan and Education Part and combining training with practical experience and also emphasis on vocational training here, I think we can dovetail that. So when I come back, let's meet and talk. I'll accommodate you. <laughs> Very interesting. Now, Mr. President, many African leaders are pushing for African countries to withdraw from the ICC, the International Criminal Court. What's your government's position on that? I want to start by saying we must develop in Africa processes, systems, and institutions. When you have that electoral process, for instance, must be foolproof, the system must, civil servants and so on must run, institution, courts, and so on. So if I have those things, I must have my own courts in Africa. If they are transparent. Well, that's not jump to conclusion. I'm <laughs> <laughs> if my courts, our courts are transparent, they are independent. So I'm saying, therefore, we must all establish that. Then we're not going to need international courts. But as Kofi Annan says, Africans asked for it, but they didn't have institutions. So are you telling me forever Africans must go to the National Criminal Court? Or must we develop our own institutions, which are credible, independent, and so on? If they are working, must we still go to the National Criminal Court? Or if we have institutions that are independent, real, independent courts, why not have it in Africa, you know, in your own country? What is very ironic is that uh, when you look at the cases that have been, in fact, uh, uh, you know, forwarded to The Hague, there are about ten. Uh, nine of those are African. Half of those, perhaps a little bit more, were, in fact, referred there by African governments. Yes. Yeah, so is it perhaps because uh, there is the issue of an African sitting president uh, who may, in fact, be... Uh, in a situation where he may be indicted, that makes some of these even founding signatories shift the goalposts about the ICC? Firstly, I would have said a lot if Americans and others have also signatories to that. I would like to ask why are they not signatories? Mm -hmm. They are the trailblazers, they, they lay the way on democracy, justice. Why are they not signatories? Yet they want Africans to go there. That question was asked to President, uh, to Madame Clinton mm. in Nairobi during ACOA. And she just said, they signed, we didn't sign. That's right. So therefore we signed, and I'm saying, we shouldn't just sign papers for the sake of signing. We must study them. What about your position on YALI, the Young African Leaders Initiative, of course, sponsored by uh, U.S. President Barack Obama, now known as the Mandela Washington Fellowship. There are some of your colleagues on the continent uh, who have an issue with it because uh, they think that uh, America is trying to choose leaders for them. Yeah, maybe it's because there is no con consultation. Uh, Shaka, can I come here and choose Peace Corps? Can I come and just choose Peace Corps people to go to Africa? No. Can I? No, you probably can't. I can. You probably can't. I can't. You can't. Maybe not. Mm. So that's the same we're talking about. You just come to a country, just pick up people who want to be vetted and so on and take them. But we're cooperating, we're partners. I mean, if you're taking my people, you are helping me, isn't it? Unless country is maybe hostile to their own people. But I mean, we don't have a problem like that. You can come, ambassadors can come and say, 
I have these people, what do you think about them? Or give us a lease, then they can take a lease, because we have our needs too. We want to be helped with that. But I don't have any problem with that, by the way. I'm just saying mm. those maybe who have a problem. I don't have. The African Union has appointed you as one of the mediators uh, in the Gabonese political crisis. We're talking here about a family political feud, really, because President Ali Bongo obviously happens to be son of uh, uh, late President Omar Bongo, and Jean Ping, a former African Union cha chairperson and former Gabonese foreign minister, happens to have two children with uh, Pascalini, Bongo's eldest daughter. The fact that uh, you have been chosen to represent Sadaka in this particular political crisis, does, in, does this amount perhaps to uh, uh, a vote of confidence in the democracy and good governance of Namibia? Well, it could, I don't know. It could be, but uh, normally we choose from each region somebody. Mm -hmm. Now, I was chosen. I didn't even know anything about it. They were in China, and they were trying to call me, but they couldn't get me. Fortunately, I didn't get my marching orders yet, but I heard it that I'm one of the people who are going to... But Namibia is a child of African solidarity and international solidarity. Countries in Africa were sacrificing their meager resources to go to mediate Namibian cause. If I'm there for us, <clears throat> must I now say and say no, whereas others sacrifice their money? Interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a time when you said that uh, you probably owe a huge debt of gratitude to Dean Rusk, U.S. Secretary of State under the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, really, because he helped you to go to America or to come to America right now and study on a scholarship. Well, I don't know whether really he signed it, but what I was trying to say is that I was in Kinshasa, Congo, Leo that time, accompanied one Mozambican who was talking to one person who came from America for scholarships. And I was sitting in the corner. When they finished, they said, are you from Mozambique? I said, no, I'm from Southwest Africa. I said, do you want scholarship? I said, yes. Then I gave my education. You are better qualified than those whom Chipanga gave us. So that way, they took my name and my friends. After a week, there was a cable signed by Dean Russ. So I keep on saying whether he signed it or I don't know. But he signed it. So therefore, I say yes. My this, scholarship was signed by him. Who is this man at Fordham, a professor, who taught you about Africa? Tilton Lemel. His brother was the ambassador in Kenya. Really? Yes. Interesting. That is the man who taught me Africa. Taught you Africa? I didn't know Africa. Any particular reason that uh, when you were at Manhattan College, really, you told the professor that uh, you came here to prepare so that I can go back and rule my country? I was sitting in a class where I was taking Greek philosophy, Greek literature, Greek history. Ten seconds. And I said, no, I didn't come for those things. I want to go and train and go back home. Very interesting. Well, unfortunately, time happens not to be our best ally. And on that note, thanks to our distinguished guest, Dr. Hage Gainigo, President of the Republic of Namibia, thanks to our fleet stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Batty. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not beta Namibia. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.